Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation to this prestigious Congress. Um, we could speak for a long time and I will try to highlight some of the important things and some of the aspects that I learned over time. Wealth preserving root replacement essentially deals with two techniques and some minor modifications, one being root remodeling designed and, uh, by and published by Magdi Jakub, and the other valve reimplantation, also known as the David operation. Both operations involve normalizations of aortic dimensions, and the initial intention or assumption was that aortic regurgitation in the presence of aortic dilatation is due to dilatation. If you fix dilatation, if you normalize aortic dimensions, you will normalize aortic valve geometry and function. So in other words, one size fits all, or one operation, if you are a genius and pick the right graft size. And this is what many surgeons have discussed. The truth, however, looks a little different. This assumption ignores, for instance, the fact that not all cusps are created equal. As Manu Thubrik, a bioengineer, showed in this cooperative study uh, with the surgeons from uh, the Mayo Clinic, the larger the root, the bigger the cusps. Now, some years ago, both authors of these operations and inventors of the operations presented and published their own late results. And the David operation in his hands was clearly superior, at least in terms of freedom from uh, reoperation, and definitely also in freedom from aortic regurgitation. And we could stop here. Let's all do the David operation. But there is more to it. We usually learn more in life from failures than we do from successes. And there have been very few analyses of failures of these operations. The first paper came out of Hanover some years ago, already 14 years ago, and they described three different types of uh, configuration, three levels at which the valves were re-implanted within the vascular graft. They saw a correlation with type C being the worst, type A being the best, and they said technique accounts for everything. I happen to disagree. This echo image here, B, very much reminds me of this 21-year-old Marfan boy. I operated in Hanover, and one and a half years ago, I had to reoperate in my current institution. The problem was not that the valve was too low within the graft. The problem in retrospect was generalized prolapse. It took us some years and the model of the bicuspid valve to determine, to, to have a better clue of the idea of prolapse. I was invited to the aortic symposium, please present your results and that was a good, a good start to look a little more carefully. We had a few valves that I had to reoperate within the first three years. All bicuspid valves, all patients had, aort had had aortic replacement in order to normalize aortic valve function. Actually, all patients had some bicuspid repair procedure. And when after patient number two, I went back and looked at the, at the echoes, the discharge echoes, they looked like this. There was something seemingly unusual with this valve. So I decided to analyze it, and, maybe, and it made me change my view. What had happened? We had a large aorta to begin with. We made it smaller. If we now look at the cusp, if we assume that the free margin of a cusp is a segment of an ellipse or a circle, and we now change radius B to B prime by every millimeter, that we reduce intercommissural distance, we will increase radius A prime or radius A to A prime and thus induce prolapse. So in other terms, by making the order smaller, yes, you can improve valve function, but you can, may also induce prolapse. Which brought me to the point 
of looking at the aortic valve from a slightly different angle. That is the difference between aortic and mitral. The dimensions of the aortic ring are much more difficult to determine than that of the mitral ring. The aortic ring not being the sinotubular junction, not being the basal diameter, to use Bob Anderson's terminology, but really this crown-shaped combination of cusp insertion lines. <clears throat> and we still do not fully understand the relative contribution of the different components. One of the key aspects was despite more than 40 years of echocardiography, very little information was available on the normal form of an aortic valve, which in theory should be definable through intercommissural distance, length of free margin, and tissue height. And we look at the valve from the wrong side, from the outflow side. We are used to looking at the mitral valve from the inflow, and we can very easily determine what's wrong with it. We now need a different form of assessment. And finally, geometry is altered by the non-filled, by the non-pressurized state of the aortic root once cardioplegia has been given. So we have to find solutions to these problems. The geometry is relatively easy to imitate by placing stay sutures on the commissures. Remember the blood, the vector of the blood will push the cusp downward and the root outward. So if we now pull upward and outward on the commissures, we can imitate the normal condition, the normal form of the aortic root. The key issue was the normal form of the aortic valve. This was known, Swanson and Clark Circulation Research, 1974. I have to admit I'm too simple a person to understand it, take it to the operating room, and know what I have to do. So based on the failures of these bicuspid valves, I felt that maybe the height difference between the basal plane and the free margins in diastole could be a helpful tool. In order to give it a name, we could have called it the Schaefer's effective height, I found was appropriate. This is something that we can measure by echo. And this is something that with a very simple tool we can also measure in the operating room. This is something that helps us in assessing the form of the aortic valve when we look at it from the outflow side. So having defined a possible parameter, we now needed to calibrate it. I went through the literature, no data. So we went back to the roots, 130 normals, including children, and we interestingly found a very good correlation between effective height and sinus diameter as well as body surface area. If you look here at the R of 0 0.8 for transthoracic echo studies, I think that's uh, amazingly close. So, and if we simply take this graph here, the normal adult patient being between 1.6 and 2.2 square meters body surface area, this effective height is in the range of 9 millimeters. Let us come back again to valve-preserving surgery, which I initially started with the David operation. I was impressed by the way he did it. It looked fun. It looked a little stomach-turning, but then once I had over overcome the first reflex, I found that it worked, ex at least in most patients. I then realized later that there may be an anatomic obstacle to it, there is, and I would like to refer to the publication by Bob Anderson, there is a muscle extension that we see occasionally into the right sinus. The so-called paper-thin paper sinus wall, which is not a root disease, but it is rather an, a congenital anomaly where the aortoventricular junction, that is the transition between ventricle and aortic wall, is simply higher than the basal ring. It's in the sinus. In a few of these patients, I tried to do the David operation. I ended up with big holes in the right ventricle, which I found scary. And that made me have a closer look at the remodeling as an alternative. Along the way, having, having mentioned the possibility of cusp prolapse, we then decided if we see cusp prolapse, we correct it. 
seemingly making the operation more complex. However, we found that not only by addressing cusp prolapse we could treat more patients that way, but also, and this is the first publication on that topic, the results were not worse. They were at least identical, maybe slightly better. We also went ahead and studied David versus Jakub in an in vitro setting with a pulse duplicator. And we saw distinct differences in cusp motion, very smooth and wide opening, relatively narrow, and systolic energy loss or gradients with increasing cardiac outputs were significantly higher with the reimplantation operation. This corresponded to echo measurements, which we did in this in vitro uh, setting, where with remodeling we saw more physiologic cusp motion compared to reimplantation. And actually, here, this looked like the cusps were close to touching the graft wall. With increasing experience, we also found another advantage. This is a study we did a few years ago. The two groups are not comparable, but that's not what I want to show you. 500 remodelings versus uh, 30 reimplantation, different diseases, different patients, and so forth. The patients also required different degrees of surgery, with remodeling requiring significantly more CABG and arch replacement, despite the fact that these patients underwent more complex surgery, myocardial ischemic time was 30 minutes less compared to re-implantation. And these were only the re-implantations I did in my current institution, so after the first 30, I, we can safely assume that I was beyond the initial learning curve. Looking at the late results, we did see some differences. Initially, bicuspid aortic valves were seemingly the easier ones with better late results. However, the most important um, effect was that of period in terms of understanding valve form as a basis for valve function. With addressing, with recognizing cusp prolapse and addressing it aggressively, our results became successively better. Dilatation at aortoventricular level or basal level, we have rarely seen after root remodeling as a cause of failure. What we have seen, however, in some of the patients that underwent reimplantation was apparent retraction of cusps. These cusps are from a 56-year-old Marfan patient. A bit old for a Marfan, but nevertheless. I had done a reimplantation operation, and then she came for progressive dilatation of the descending aorta. I restudied the valve. She had not come for a follow-up for three years. She had grade 3 AR. So I thought I'd missed the prolapse. This was before introduction of the intraoperative measurement. Let's first fix the aortic valve, and then we can safely go towards, uh, to the descending aorta. And I was surprised. <coughs> Normal cusp height, tissue height, is in the range of two centimeters from the free margin to the nadir. And you can see how low these are. So quite apparently there was retraction of cusps, and this may be related to the observation, the in vitro observation, of cusps coming very close to the aortic wall. We later, we then did a study, a clinical study, to see whether remodeling or reimplantation long term made a difference. It really did not, if we look at global results here. There was a difference in patients with a very dilated aortoventricular junction who had inferior results, who had inferior results with both remodeling and reimplantation, which brought up the question, was a large aortoventricular junction a true pathologic entity by itself, or was it rather a surrogate marker of extreme root dilatation 
which then led to more size reduction and more induction of prolapse. In order to account for that in this retrospective study, we simply looked at the difference between patients who had aggressive cusp plication and those who did not, we, who were earlier in the series. And as you can see on the right-hand slide, no cusp plication were the patients who did not do well. There are some other aspects. Remodeling has been published to be bad news for patients with acute aortic dissection. This is something we cannot confirm. We have recently submitted our, the results of the first 60 patients treated by uh, root remodeling in acute dissection, and we have found excellent valve stability 10 years and beyond. More recently, we have looked into an aspect that has been proposed by Emmanuel Lansac um, with a little more energy than I put into it. That is the addition of, a, of an annuloplasty to valve remodeling. Yes, we have seen a higher proportion of competent valves initially postoperatively. However, the long-term durability, freedom from reoperation so far, has not been influenced in a positive way by the addition of an annuloplasty. Rather, valve pathology, being tricuspid, bicuspid or unicuspid has been the primary determinant of valve durability. And this reflects the complexity of the aortic valve repair that was associated with it. In tricuspid aortic valves, we have had a learning effect. This was even more pronounced in bicuspid valves. And overall, Root remodeling has become our preferred approach to uh, valve preserving root replacement. What do experts say rec regarding the difference between root remodeling and valve reimplantation? And I quote Tyrone David from his paper in the, in the seminars on the topic. Both techniques are useful in preserving the aortic valve. With either technique, restoration of normal aortic annulus, maybe, and cusp geometry, definitely, is the single most important technical aspect. Selection of the graft is a complex problem in aortic valve reimplantation. We have stated numerous times that reimplantation is the more complex operation. Remodeling, which is the technically less demanding procedure. And finally, and I would agree 100% with this statement, irrespective of the choice of root remodeling, the surgeon has to, op has to have an open and receptive mind and balanced view of these two operations. And the key aspect or the key question is, is the form of the aortic valve at the end of the operation normal or not? Let me conclude that both root remodeling and valve reimplantation are valid approaches to valve preservation in aortic aneurysm and also dissection, which is a bit more challenging, if normal valve form is achieved. Remodeling requires a shorter myocardial ischemic time and it can be applied more liberally, especially in these anatomic scenarios in which there is muscle extension, in particular, into the right sinus. Yes, remodeling may lead to more prolapse because, in general, smaller grafts are taken and there is more reduction of intercommissural distance. On the other hand, cusp prolapse can be detected once you're aware of the problem can be detected and corrected quite easily. The key issue is cusp configuration at the end of the operation must be as close to normal as possible. Whether the addition of an annuloplasty increases long-term results, we do not know as yet. There is a higher proportion of competent aortic valves early postoperatively, but whether this is a true benefit to the patient, we simply don't know. <clears throat> In summary, both root remodeling 
and valve reimplantation are operations for a vast majority of patients with pliable and non-retracted aortic cusps in order to avoid the problems of valve prosthesis. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>